All right, we're going to take another pass at our survey winners. Fingers crossed here. Go back to the top of the list. Do we have Chris Spears from Internet 2 in the room? Chris Spears. All right. We've got an iPad mini for you, I believe, at the registration desk. All right. We actually got one this time. Thank you. And yeah, we're running a little bit early. Uh, coming up next, we have Richard Steenbergen. So, I'm Richard Steenbergen uh, with GTT. You might formerly know me from Inlayer. Uh, I got bought a year ago and now GTT. Uh, so I'm here to talk about MPLS RCPTE uh, using auto bandwidth, uh, some of the practical lessons that uh, we've learned from using it and where it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense in your network. So quick recap of what we're talking about. MPLS Traffic Engineering 101. In a classic network with just IGPs, uh, all you would have is a network path defined by the, the SPF calculation, whatever the lowest cost is uh, by adding up a bunch of metrics. Uh, and that's fine for simple networks, but gets really, really complicated really quickly when you have very complex topology. It's very hard to load balance. So traffic engineering takes this and adds an additional constraint. For example, find the lowest cost path that also has available bandwidth. And if you can't find available bandwidth, then maybe you would rather map the traffic on something that is one millisecond higher latency, but won't drop the packets. Uh, so to do this, uh, the, the common protocol is RSVPTE. Uh, and the way that it works is it goes out, it measures the amount of bandwidth between two, two devices on a network go, going over an LSP. It makes a reservation. It tracks what circuit that bandwidth is going over. Uh, and it will deny additional reservations if you run out of capacity. And then hopefully you'll be able to find a path that actually does have capacity, the goal being to be able to manage your network without dropping packets, uh, even when you've got large complex topologies with lots of different available paths. And the bandwidth is measured at the LSP, the label switch path label. So for every LSP that's configured, you have a bandwidth number associated with it. And then RCP maps that, that across the individual links. So here's a quick example of where that would kind of make sense. Take a really simple network and you say, how might I route from Los Angeles to Chicago? So that might be your shortest path to go up through uh, Salt Lake City and then come over to Chicago. Uh, that might be your second best path and that might only be one or two milliseconds higher. That might be your third best path that might actually only be three milliseconds higher. That might be your, your fourth best path. Um, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can go about getting traffic somewhere. And again, the, the goal would be it's better to get the traffic there even if the latency is slightly higher than it is to drop the packet. So the real question then becomes how do you go about measuring your LSP bandwidth? Uh, how do you figure out how much bandwidth you're going to reserve for a particular LSP? Um, because after all, you're talking about completely dynamic packet switch networks and bandwidth can change in an instant. So how do you go about this? There's two main methods. Uh, the number one method is offline calculation. So this is uh, kind of how the big carriers started when they first started doing this. Uh, they would have a bunch of offline tools that they would apply a bunch of fancy math to make a prediction. They would say, well, we kind of think the bandwidth is going to be X between these two devices for the next day. Uh, and you put lots of, of math and lots of external tools into that. Um, and you can kind of get somewhere with it. Uh, but it's, it's very fixed. It's the kind of thing you can only roll out every 12 hours or every 24 hours or, or even less often. Uh, but that was how MPLS uh, RSVPTE was first deployed. And the next method is auto bandwidth. And basically this is having the router itself measure the traffic going across the LSP and dynamically update the reservation um, as the bandwidth changes. So that's what I'm talking about here. Uh, so the big advantage of, of doing offline calculation is you can use any implement in any modeling algorithm you want. Uh, you can get as, as fancy or as, as non-fancy as you want. You can pay someone a lot of money for a good solution. You can uh, go hire a bunch of PhDs to come up with a very nice theoretical model. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but again, like I said, you are limited to how often you can go out and deploy and you're also kind of um, 
you either have to spend a lot of money writing it yourself or you have to, to pay someone a lot of money for software to do it. Uh, with auto bandwidth, because it's run directly on the routers, you can respond to these rapidly changing traffic conditions. So if a link fails or if a, a peer changes and you now need to reroute traffic um, in five minutes, you can do that as opposed to waiting a day uh, to adapt to those changes. So it turns out to be uh, good at that. It's easier to implement, um, but you're, you're kind of constrained to the algorithm that the router vendor gives you on your particular router. So here's kind of an example showing the, the bandwidth adjustment interval. So if you look at a 24-hour adjustment window, you're not being very efficient. If you look at a much shorter, so this example is like a 1.5-hour adjustment interval, you can see that you're being much more efficient. You're, you're realizing the bandwidth is coming down at an off-peak hour, and you're now able to, to use that circuit for something else. So it's much better to do it that way. Um, so next question is, how does auto bandwidth actually work? Uh, it turns out, well, it's an entirely router-specific behavior, but it turns out that the two main vendors that do this, Cisco and Juniper, both implemented it in kind of the same way. Shockingly, a lot of similar employees going back and forth. Um, so the algorithm kind of looks exactly the same. Uh, you have uh, what's called a statistics interval. So that gives you one data sample. So for example, say you, you had a statistics interval of 60 seconds. Uh, you would, over a period of 60 seconds, measure the traffic rate over a particular LSP, and that would be one sample. You then have an adjust interval that looks at multiple samples and says, for, for example, say you did a, a five minute adjust interval. You would look at your five 60 second samples and you would say, at the peak sample that occurred during the last five minutes, was it a sufficient enough change for me to go re-signal? And if it was, then you would go tear down your old LSP, tear up your, set up your new LSP, uh, and, and preserve the, the new bandwidth across the network. Um, again, with the, the adjust threshold, uh, that kind of lets you set how much uh, you want to have change. So here's an example where auto bandwidth works really well. Uh, you look at your, your five minute sample or uh, 10-minute sample or whatever it is, uh, and you say, well, the bandwidth changed, so now I make a reservation, oh, the bandwidth changed again, so now I lower the reservation, and you still kind of mostly work. Here's an example where auto bandwidth doesn't work well. If you have highly bursty traffic, uh, you, you might get a, a burst that's very high. You might go increase your reservation right as you're, you're falling down, and then later you, uh, you might lower your reservation right as you're going up. So you want to have a, a, a quick time. You don't want to let it sit around for uh, six hours uh, and not react to changing traffic conditions because you're always going to have changing traffic conditions. Um, there's a feature called underflow and overflow uh, that are used to have a default long adjust interval but to react quickly in the event of a change. So say, for example, you might set a default adjust interval of six hours or an hour or something, something high, but then have uh, overflow come along and look, and it's, if it says there's been more than five samples that have been over X threshold uh, that I wasn't expecting, I need to react quicker than I was expecting, I need to resignal. And the underflow is the, the same thing, but uh, in the opposite direction. Um, so there's a lot of vendors that don't support underflow. Uh, it just recently got added in Junos. Uh, it's in iOS XR, uh, but there's a lot of cases where it, uh, uh, it, it isn't there. So you've got to be careful that if you react quickly to an increase in traffic, you also need to react quickly to a decrease in traffic, or else you might reserve bandwidth that isn't really there. But what I'm really here to talk about is where it all goes wrong. So. It turns out that RSCPTE is very good at adapting to changing traffic conditions within your network. So for example, if you have a circuit fail and you need to find a different circuit within your network, it's great at that. It turns out to be very bad at adapting to changing traffic destinations. So if you consider that example uh, from Los Angeles to Chicago. Say you're sending to a peer in Chicago and your, your peer goes down, and now you need to change the traffic to New York. For your entire next adjustment interval, you will not know that your traffic has changed significantly. You're not changing how the LSP is routed, you're changing which LSP the traffic goes on. That's where it tends to, to get problematic. Uh, so again, that's where you want to have very rapid reaction uh, to make sure that you're not congesting your network. Um, it turns out that overflow and underflow actually aren't all that useful. Um, 
basically if you just consider, like I said, the, the previous example, if you don't have underflow, uh, like a lot, of, uh, a lot of devices don't, then you can't react quickly to changing, decreasing traffic. Um, and it, it also kind of doesn't really accomplish anything because you could just as easily set your adjust interval lower and do the exact same thing. Uh, so at, at a certain point, there's really no point in, in doing it. You could just use a lower adjust interval and that's probably the, the way that you want to go. Um, the next big problem is, of course, the LSPs don't just create themselves. MPLS is not entirely automatic. It has a signaling protocol, but the signaling protocol still requires you to go configure an LSP uh, every single time. So the, the big problem there is, of course, uh, you've got to find some way to automate this. Um, usually some type of, of tool that you write yourself or some type of third-party tool. Or in some cases, uh, you have router vendors that have auto mesh capabilities and basically what this is is you feed it a list of all your, your core links and it will uh, go build a, a full mesh of LSPs between them. Uh, the problem is it turns out to be very, very basic. So say for example uh, Cisco IOS, um, you can create uh, a list, uh, you can create a mesh of LSPs from a, from a template. The template turns out to be an access list, uh, the type of access list that you can't remove a single entry from without nuking the entire entry. Uh, you have no capability to do multiple parallel LSPs. It's very, very simplistic. So in reality, you really need to have actual tools come along and create all these LSPs for you. Um, it, especially if you want to, to be able to manually change the configuration of, of an LSP later, you can't do it if it's created by most of the auto mesh tools that are out there. Uh, Juniper doesn't even have a, a built-in auto mesh. What they tell you to do is use commit scripts. Um, which are a really handy tool for doing that type of thing, uh, but that's kind of in the create it yourself category. The next big problem is large LSPs don't fit down small pipes. So remember, an LSP can only be moved as an atomic unit. You can't take an LSP and split it across two paths. You have to send it down one layer two path. Uh, so if you have one really large LSP relative to the, the size of the circuit that it's going across, you end up with an, a packing problem, an efficiency problem. So say, for example, you have three 6 gig LSPs going across two 10 gig circuits. What's going to happen is 18 gigs trying to go down 20 gigs of pipe. It should fit, right? It doesn't if they're running as two independent 10 gig circuits. You'll be able to fit two of them on one. The third won't be able to use it uh, because you can't put two 6 gig LSPs on a 10 gig circuit. Um, so common workarounds for this. Um, number one, you could just go con configure LACP bundles, uh, so that makes your, your bigger layer two bundles. Uh, but the problem there is, again, you're, you're constrained to the smallest path in your network. So say, for example, you had an OC48 still floating around your network. Um, you could never route an LSP that is bigger than 2.5 gigs across it, so you need to go keep your LSP smaller than that. A uh, common solution for that is to create multiple parallel LSPs. So instead of the, the three 6 gig LSPs, um, say you, you just created three parallel LSPs for each one, now you've got nine 2 gig LSPs and that's going to pack much more efficiently. Uh, but again, you've got to go create all these LSPs and, and be responsible for this. Um, next interesting problem is how auto bandwidth behaves under stress. So for example, consider what happens when you can't find any bandwidth anywhere in your network. Uh, whether it's the, the, a real capacity problem or whether it's uh, just a, a software bug that mismeasures. Um, what, what is the behavior that you think you should do when you go to update an, uh, an LSP and you don't have enough bandwidth anywhere to fulfill the need? Um, one solution is to uh, just leave the bandwidth signaled what it was previously, which might be a good thing or might not be a good thing because if you previously signaled one gig and now you're trying to push five gigs, you're pushing five gigs across uh, an LSP that's not accounting for it anywhere in the system. And if you leave that going, you're just going to sit there and congest your links and not know about it. Um, one of the other behaviors that can happen is the, the LSP will simply fail to resignal and will time out and go away. So consider the pathological condition where you've got a large number of parallel links. So you've got eight parallel LSPs going between two routers and for some reason you run out of available bandwidth and you can't signal one and it, it shuts down. So now you've got seven. All the traffic that was ECPing across eight links now moves to seven. The traffic goes up for each one. Now you're, you're more and more likely to not be able to get a reservation for that next one. It fails. You go down to six. Boom, 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 all the way down to one giant LSP that won't fit anywhere. Uh, and you sometimes have to have a human come along and, and clear it out uh, to restore things. 
Um, so one of the things that, that we've played with uh, is to, to try and create a more intelligent auto mesh script. So imagine that you could uh, create a, an auto mesh script that lets you fork an LSP when it gets too big. So if you, if you set a random threshold in your network and you said, I don't want any LSP to go above one gig or five gigs or 10 gigs, whatever it is. Um, when you see traffic get to a certain point, you now need to, to fork. You basically want to create two, L, two parallel LSPs, shift, split the traffic across them, and, and load balance. Um, turns out there's a lot of gotchas uh, in doing something like this. So the first one is the newly created LSP is going to come up and signal with a bandwidth of zero for your first adjust interval. Uh, so what's going to happen is if in a good case, uh, you, you have one LSP, you split into two, they both go over the same link, and so the one LSP is accounting for the traffic of both, and it kind of works out. In a bad case, you signal a new LSP, and it goes over a link that you, uh, a different link. So now you've got over here, you're over-reserving on one link, and you're under-reserving on another, you're creating congestion. And there's really no way in any of the current Cisco Juniper implementations to override this. There's not a, a uh, initial bandwidth setting. Uh, so you can't compensate for something like this with, a, with an external tool. Um, and like I said, it, it can lead to the whole pathological LSP collapse scenario. Uh, the next interesting thing is that auto bandwidth really doesn't know anything about congestion. It's a, it's a simple counter. Uh, it counts the number of octets going across an LSP and derives a rate, uh, but it doesn't know when the link is actually congested. So imagine, for example, that there's any type of bug uh, or, or issue that causes congestion on a link that you don't know about, your, your TCP is going to throttle back, your IP traffic is going to go down, and all the bandwidth is going to adapt to that new rate. So you can get into a situation where if you don't have enough headroom in the way that you, you run things, um, you, you don't know about this and you just sit there persistently dropping traffic and, and never reacting to it. Um, you also have to be careful about what routers can actually see in terms of layer two overhead. So for example, we run an all Juniper network uh, and it turns out that the, the Juniper MT and MX series can't actually measure layer two overhead. So if you get a 28 byte UDP packet that's actually consuming 84 bytes across the wire by the time you figure in your, your padding, your frame overhead and all that, uh, you don't know about it. You don't know about e even the headers, let alone uh, any of the, the link overhead. Uh, so you might have a, a DOS attack come in and you might have a 10 gig link sitting at seven gigs that you, RCP thinks is perfectly fine, but you're actually congesting the link and dropping packets. Um, so basically the, the practical suggestions that I've come up with for, for doing auto bandwidth, it, I still think that it's ultimately a really good system. You, you can't really design a complex network uh, that's modeling traffic every 24 hours. You can, but you'll be very, very inefficient about it, and you'll be spending a lot of money uh, keeping things, keep adding more capacity than you really need. So it, it's something you really want to try and, and use, and anyone that's running a large MPLS network that isn't using all domain with, I would suggest you really look at it, but be aware that there's, there's a bunch of uh, implementation details out there. Um, so again, you, you still have to have humans monitoring it to make sure you're not getting into, into the pathological LSP collapse. You have to uh, keep an eye out for all, all the different uh, types of conditions that I talked about. Um, my personal recommendation is don't bother with overflow or underflow, especially if you don't have underflow, but just, just use a lower adjust interval. Uh, but be very, very aware of vendor bugs. So for example, we've actually seen a lot of instances recently with Juniper where they have mismeasurement problems which is kind of comical when your LSP measures at 50 terabits, and you're like, hmm, I'm not going to find bandwidth for that anywhere in the network, so it's just going to fail the signal. It's a little less comical when it accidentally measures 50 gigabits on an LSP that's actually not doing anything, uh, especially when it turns out to be a very high priority LSP that comes along and preempts a bunch of other traffic and really screws your customers. Uh, so you really, really, really got to be careful for those types of measurement bugs. Uh, and we've seen maybe six different bugs over the last few years, including some that just recently uh, uh, were in the, the stable 10.4 uh, uh, extended, uh, extended life branch. Um, so you really, really, really got to be careful that you're, you're, you're going to have this type of issue no matter what, whether it's your third party tool or whether it's the, the vendor provided tool, but you've got to make sure that your bandwidth measurements are accurate or it's not going to work very well. Uh, and like I said, careful monitoring your network is still needed. And what I really suggest people nag their vendors for is 
one of the, the major annoyances that I have is there's a, an adjust threshold that says if the, the bandwidth has changed by a percent amount. So you might say if the bandwidth has changed by 5%, then I want to resignal. Otherwise, I don't. And remember that uh, because of the, the way RCP is designed, there's no way to actually just say, I want to change the reservation from 1.1 gigs to 1.4 gigs. You actually have to signal a new LSP uh, with make before break, uh, tear down the old LSP. It's relatively complicated and uses a fair amount of resources on the router, especially if you've got thousands of these LSPs across your network that are all resignaling simultaneously. So, for example, if you change traffic from 500 kilobits to 550 kilobits, you probably don't care. Uh, but there's no, on Cisco or Juniper's implementation, there's no uh, minimum threshold by bytes. It's only percent. So you see a 5% change, you're going to go resignal. Um, really, the vendors need to work on better, uh, better LSP auto mesh capabilities. Um, like I said, the, the tools that are out there right now, not the best, and they really don't handle anything uh, more than a very simple network. So if you, you create a very simple auto mesh, but then you decide that you need to add a, a second parallel LSP, or you decide you need to tweak the setting on one LSP, you can't do that. Um, so some, some more tools would really be useful. Uh, if you're going to make any use of overflow, then you really need to have underflow as well, or you're, you're setting yourself up for problems. Um, one thing that I'd really like to see is, is kind of a way to automatically fork large LSPs of a certain size. And I've heard that Juniper is doing some work on this, um, but I'm not sure what version of code that's going to come out at. Uh, but I if you go routinely over a certain LSP size, then, then what you might actually want is dynamic creation of LSPs, not something that you have to go configure in your device, but something that will go automatically fork and load balance the traffic. And when you do that, you get the capability to correctly signal, correctly uh, resignal both LSPs simultaneously, put the correct bandwidth values in each one, do all of that type of stuff. Uh, so it would be it would be very helpful. Um, one thing that turns out to be slightly annoying about uh, having a lot of different parallel LSPs to, to balance your traffic across is it kind of breaks your your CLI. Uh, so if you look at a show route and you now see 16 different next hops for every entry because it's balancing across the 16 LSPs, um, that gets really annoying really quickly. Uh, so a way to to kind of hide that uh, again with with dynamically created LSPs that's something that you could do. Um, the ability to set an initial bandwidth reservation. So if you do have a, a third party tool or an in-house developed tool that wants to come along and, and fork an LSP, go create the second one. Um, right now you have no way to signal the initial bandwidth. You, you have to set it at zero and let it run a full adjust interval before it sorts itself out. Um, so the ability to come along and, and, uh, and fix that. Um, and then probably an operational mode command. Uh, for example, in, in Juniper where you have to go commit everything, it might not make sense for you to have to go do a commit, and if you've got a very complex config with a lot of scripts, a very long commit potentially, uh, for you to go change a, an LSP size. Uh, so like an operational mode command where you could uh, go request a, an LSP size to, to change to a specific value. And then you could have third party tools come along and keep an eye on the LSPs and reset them uh, away from the automatically configured one if, if something like that came up. Uh, these are the things that I'd really love to see vendors implement. Um, so far, no luck. but. Um, Questions? Mike. <laughs> Still thinking I'm in grade school. Um, James from Wide Open West. Um, have you tried anything from an automation point of view with uh, creating new uh, LSPs and then initiating like a, an auto bandwidth, uh, I guess, re-signaling or like uh, there's a command to do that, so. There's a command um, in Juniper for certain uh, to recalculate, but it doesn't actually do what you're thinking. Um, there's no way for it to manually adapt to a new bandwidth setting. Um, so we've done some stuff with this. We've done some, uh, some uh, commit script based creation of LSPs and so I can have a tool that comes along and, and forks uh, LSPs as needed and I can have dynamic uh, bandwidth uh, configured uh, or dynamic numbers of LSPs configured. Um, but it, you run into the, the problems that I was talking about. There's no way to set the initial bandwidth. There's no clean way to, uh, to certainly without a long uh, commit to, to go 
um, readjust those types of things and there's no way to even manually adjust it but then have it fall back to auto after some period of time. So those are the, the big gotchas with doing it. Joseph with NTT. Uh, I've got a question about priorities. Did you have to use that very often to get around problems or did you have to play with that at all? Uh, so we do LSP priorities um, just because we have different levels of service we want to offer customers. So kind of our design philosophy was instead of going out and buying uh, a, a dark fiber system and putting all your eggs in one basket uh, to kind of go out and buy a bunch of lit waves. And one of the, the benefits of that is it gives you a lot of different diverse fiber paths. So for example, between New York and Ashburn, I've got five different diverse fiber paths. Um, some of them are going to have lower latencies than others. So if I have a very latency sensitive financial customer that wants the best path, I'm going to put them in a higher priority LSP that's going to go preempt uh, some best effort traffic, put it on a, a higher latency link. So we make extensive use of it from that perspective. Uh, one of the other things that, that we had to do um, just to, to make things be sensible was give, um, so we, we have four priorities and then we break each priority into one or two uh, if it's a long LSP or a short LSP. So for example, I would rather have the traffic go slightly out of its way for the, the short LSP. So you, you take a, a circuit that might be five milliseconds and make it 10 milliseconds rather than have it go to 40 milliseconds just so that a, a 75 millisecond path doesn't go to 80. Uh, so there's some, some manual optimization that you want to do on that front, but for the most part it kind of uh, runs itself and does uh, the, the customer prioritization that you would expect. And the uh, interval between recomputing, did you have to play with that a lot or did it just you uh, pick we, something and you stuck with it? We definitely did. Um, we are doing 60 second samples and five minute adjust intervals uh, and there's definitely been a lot of cases over the years where that's caused problems. So uh, an example, an early, uh, early implementation detail was that uh, the adjust intervals weren't all staggered. So if you had a, a five minute interval, they would all run at once, uh, which would do bad things. So uh, the way that it works now is that if you've got a thousand LSPs, it'll do one every couple seconds kind of thing uh, to spread the load. Um, but so you, you do have to kind of look at that and, uh, and make sure that your, your router resources are reasonable. So there is a lot of slosh when it does that, when it does that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Just a few notes. Uh, coming up after lunch, we've got uh, Brian Field from Comca Comcast talking about topology discoveries using BGP link state. And Jeff Wheeler with Innovative Network Concepts talking about IPv6 neighbor discovery problems. We'll also have our first block of lightning talks. We still have uh, openings for uh, tomorrow's lightning talk block. So if you've got any ideas, please submit them. We're accepting submissions until 7 p.m. tonight. And please do complete the surveys. We're giving out iPad minis. Uh, we very much want your feedback on the program, the breaks, the meals everything we got. We're going to go ahead and break for lunch a little bit early. We'll see you back here at 2.45. Thank you very much.